Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Today's edition of Ask an Airstreamer is all about using your Airstream when it's cold outside. By the end of this session, we hope you'll, you'll feel more comfortable using your Airstream this winter. From fewer people to no bugs, there are many advantages to using your Airstream in the wintertime. Before introducing our panelists today, I wanna to take a moment to introduce myself. My name is Chris, and in addition to being an Airstream owner myself, I get to work with Airstream's brand ambassadors, helping to share their stories of adventure, curiosity, and exploration in their Airstream. A few housekeeping items before we get started. Today's session is being recorded and will be published on airstream.com next week alongside other editions of Ask an Airstreamer. In other words, don't worry about writing everything down. You'll receive an email to this video later next week. To submit your questions at any point today, go ahead and click the Q&A button at the bottom of this screen. We'll do our best to answer all of them, but if we run out of time, we'll share an email address at the end to submit your questions. At the end, we'll share a promo code for Airstream Supply Company, which is part magazine, part travel guide, and part outfitter. Lastly, there's a two question survey that will pop up after we wrap up today. We'd love your feedback so we can learn what you liked and things we can do better in future editions. So let's take a quick look at what we're going to cover. First, we'll talk about the benefits of airstreaming in the wintertime. We'll learn about how to do it, including some tips on towing. And we'll also cover some gear that makes it easier to use your airstream in the winter. We'll also have a Q&A session at the end. Before introducing our panelists, I want to highlight a recent Ask an Airstreamer we published on how to winterize your airstream. We'll go ahead and pop some links into the chat, but if you haven't seen this already, check it out. It'll be complimentary to, to today's discussion. So let's meet our panelists. Diane owns multiple Airstreams, lives in Canada, and uses her Airstream extensively in the winter, or as Diane calls it, winter streaming. And we also have Andrea Ombach, who owns a base camp, lives in Seattle, and takes shorter trips. She uses her base camp as a base camp to support her weekend winter adventures. Thank you both so much for being here. Diane, tell us a little bit about yourself and what you love about Airstreaming in the winter. Oop, let me uh, let me unmute you. Here we go. All right, you should be able to uh, unmute yourself, Diane. There you go. There you go. Hi. Welcome. Hi, hi everybody. Yeah, so my name is Diane. I'm originally from France, from Central Bay. I always dreamt about our stream since I was a kid. So when I actually moved to Canada. Uh, over 16 years ago, I wanted to buy an Airstream right away and I never camped or towed or anything before. And I started full timing right away and it was March East Coast. So it was pretty cold. <laughs> so I wanted to actually empower people and women and show that it is absolutely possible to uh, full time or winter camp in an Airstream. And uh, I'm actually, it's yeah, it's absolutely magic. No bugs and uh, a lot of more space uh, and uh, yeah so I wanted to share a little bit of tips and uh, show you how uh, how to uh, winter cam winter stream I've been doing that for over 10 years so yeah it's pretty fun awesome thank you Diane Andrea welcome hi everyone I'm Andrea Umbach and I live in Seattle Washington and McCall Idaho and I've had a base camp for three years I'm an avid skier so the base camp uh, I use for that purpose in the winter, I go to uh, ski resorts parking lots and camp for one or two or three nights and ski. So that's how I use my base camp in the winter. Awesome. So both Diane and Andrea, we've talked previously about some of the most uh, enjoyable places that you like to go. Uh, Diane, share with us a little bit about where you like to go when you think about going airstreaming in the wintertime. Well, that's one of my favorite spots in Canada. I've been uh, doing uh, east to west uh, across Canada wintertime, towing a few times. And uh, and this is Banff National Park, Lake Louise, Lake Emerald. Those are beautiful uh, spot you have the hot springs uh, emerald crystal water so that's and that's in the middle of the Rockies of course Canadian Rockies it's yeah one of my favorites but I highly recommend you to to uh, to go have it to check it out and and Diana a little bit you know different than the summertime where the challenge is really really uh, trying to secure reservations 
uh, and, <clears throat> and find a place to camp. In the wintertime, a little bit different because not every campground is, is obviously open because roads aren't always maintained uh, all the way through until you get to some of these parks and places to camp. What's your resource to, to understand what's open and, and well, what's not? Absolutely. Well, um, I actually ended up doing um, east to west uh, in Canada winter time and boondocking the whole time uh, mm. because, well, you know, you, you, the campgrounds are all or can be closed. And uh, so you don't have you won't be having even uh, full hookup or water access or anything, but it's still doable. So basically what I do, um, I, I love the journey more than the destination. So what I do is I, I basically look online while I'm on the road and I'm really um, looking for the weather. So if, uh, if there is a snowstorm coming up, I readjust and uh, I boondock and you know, you can always, uh, you have time, right? That's the whole point of being in your airstream. Uh, you're not on a schedule. So basically I'm looking online and, you know, and uh, calling and seeing if the, some spots are open and then I readjust depending on that. And uh, yeah, and boondocking is easy. I mean, even in the winter time too. Awesome. Andrea, what about what about you? What are some of your favorite places to camp and what resources do you use to even in your use case where you're talking about using it in the, you know, the parking lot at the ski hill, yeah. uh, understanding how to how to navigate that? Yeah, well, my favorite two ski resorts to go to with my base camp because I keep it in Seattle are um, Crystal Mountain, Washington and Mission Ridge, Washington. Uh, in both cases, and I would say in all cases of ski resorts, it's really important to go to their website, look to see what their rules are about camping in their parking lots and if they have hookups or not. In these two cases, uh, Crystal Mountain does have hookups and you can plug in. Mission Ridge doesn't. So um, they're both, both two different scenarios for how you go uh, with your trailer and how you would spend your two or three days there. But um, I use the websites. I also call and sometimes uh, they will allow you to make a reservation a couple days before so that you're not rushing up to the ski hill on Thursday night uh, to get a spot. Some of these ski resorts now are allowing reservations for their camping spots in their parking lots. So that's what I do. It, it's a great use for it. When I discovered that you could do this, it, it just changed the whole outlook on doing winter sports because now you could have a weekend doing it versus the long drive to the ski hill maybe and then back and then you know maybe a repeat of that on day two so great great use and and great kind of inspirational places to go um let's talk a little bit about how to do this because i think that's really why uh, most folks have signed up to join us today and and before we do that i just wanted to cover a little bit about what happens at the airstream factory before you actually you know go to take it out into the, into the winter so just a quick kind of clockwise review of the, the photos on this screen. The, the first one is on, on every Airstream travel trailer, <clears throat> there's a space in between the inner and the outer skin. And so this uh, picture on the left is the installation being installed on that and that wall kind of going up to the ceiling. Uh, it's an eco bat in, in, uh, installation. Um, does a really good job in that small amount of space of doing it. And if we go clockwise and kind of the top right, this is a, another layer of insulation that basically sits between the chassis and the floor. So we're gonna talk a little bit about how to uh, you know, beef this up a bit for extremely cold temperatures, but there is a layer there. And then the last uh, piece here, because we'll also get into talking about heating the tanks and keeping things from freezing. Uh, I know it's tiny, but the little, uh, this is at the factory where the, the shell uh, becomes one with the chassis. And what we've tried to circle there in that little red circle is the, the heating vent for units that have forced air furnaces. It's actually routed down into the tanks and where they're kept to help keep them from freezing. So if the furnace is running, there's warm air being uh, pumped down there. Not every unit has a forced air furnace like Andrea's base camp, for example. So she has electric tank heaters that help do that job. So that's a quick overview. Diane's gonna uh, give us a little bit more detail on how to keep things from freezing on the outside. Yes, thank you, Chris. So here is a, a picture of my setup. So the really the most important is a heated water hose. So here, as you can see, I have my heated water hose. Uh, I have in, in I had it insulation uh, pipe insulation. You can find it in any kind of uh, home hardware stores. So I had it that on top, and I secured it with duct tape on top of that. 
I also have edit tape that I apply on the faucet in on the water here at the bottom there. So basically with that, you can have, you can really have all your comfort. Uh, and as I said, like I have full time uh, for 10 years and especially in Canada. So I, I dealt with a lot of cold temperatures. I never had frozen pipes. Uh, make sure that you open your closet at night, you know, just to help air circulation. And uh, yes, and the e tape, you can even put it also on the sewer hose, right? So basically, with that, you won't have any frozen pipes. You can also, just to have a little bit more of safety in really cold temperature, uh, you can open your faucets and let the water drip just to make it, you know, just to be on the safe side. But uh, yeah, with that, and it comes in all kinds of length. Um, even you never know what kind of weather you're going to have on the road, right? So um, I always say it's kind of a part of the basic that you should have a heated water hose. And on this this next slide, Diane, and uh, one quick uh, tip too on the sewer hose, uh, especially if you've had one that's been you know used a lot, seen a lot of summertime use. If it's nearing the end of its life and you're planning on going winter camping, now's a great time to think about re replacing that because it's going to be you know put under a little bit more stress being exposed to those temperatures. Um, additional considerations here, uh, Diane, from uh, your experience. Yeah, so um, here's part of my basics too. So basically, as I said, like, you know, just to help hair circulation, open your closet uh, so that it will help uh, warm up your pipes. There's, a, of course, you will use your furnace a lot. Uh, you can use additional um, sources of eating. Uh, so I have infrared eater, I have a space eater. Um, that also helps a lot with the propane consumption because you will use a lot of propane in the winter time. So yeah, and, uh, and here, as you can see on the picture, there is uh, those max air vents. I absolutely love them. They cover your fantastic fan and it allows the fantastic fan to stay open, uh, whether it's you're on the road towing, whether it's raining, snowing, because you will need ventilation in your trailer. You're gonna create a lot of condensation uh, when you're cooking. So I always leave the, the fantastic fan open. I crack, uh, we, I open the fans in the bathroom, in the shower as well. So really, uh, that will help air, air circulation, dehumidifier as well. You can have add a little fan also, but uh, yeah, that's really part of the basics. And of course, assuming that you have short power to, to plug your space eater and your infrared eater. So it's a little bit counterintuitive, right? So it's really cold outside and here we are talking about opening, opening vents, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I wanted to just talk a little bit about that because you're absolutely right. If you want to avoid the, the drips in the ceiling and get some of the moisture out of the airstream, uh, my experience has been, I'll just, it's not always about maybe turning the fan on uh, or maybe if it is, it's on very low, but even just opening the top of it uh, so the hot air can come out. Is that what you do or will you, we actually leave the fan running to help get the air out? Absolutely, Chris. No, I don't even leave the, the fan on. I just uh, leave the fan on when I take my shower or, you know, but uh, honestly, most of the time, I just li leave them a little bit open and mm -hmm. that will help a lot. But of course, you will need a dehumidifier regardless because depending on how, well, uh, how many people are in the trailer as well, like we were sometimes three with dogs and, you know, so that creates a lot of fun and things. So uh, yeah, so I use a dehumidifier. I have forty pounds dehumidifier, and basically hand it every opening your windows, crack your windows. Okay, but I think you. Um... Level, and it's going to be a. Yeah, it's it's my my furnace is always set at seventy five. So basically I could have parrots living in my trailer. So it's, it can be very cold outside, but <laughs> really warm inside. <laughs> All right, a couple, a couple of questions here that are coming in that I wanna make sure that we get to. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, it, planning where to drive, um, you know, so a lot of times in the winter time, um, you, you'll hear advisories on either traction tires required or things like that. Uh, Andrea, I'll start with you. How do you decide when it's you know, safe to actually go out there? Uh, I assume it's the same rules that would apply for driving your car with maybe a little layer of caution on top of that because now you're towing something. Yeah, and especially because I'm headed to ski resorts, 
you know, they're planning on people, lots of people headed up there. So I'm looking ahead to see uh, what, you know, what the road conditions are and also when are they likely to plow. Um, the pattern that I see, especially at the ski resorts, is they're likely to plow before a lot of people are going to be headed up in the morning and in the evening right before people are, are heading out. So I, I kind of plan on um, the ski resort doing most of the plowing for me and clearing out that parking lot for me. And most of the ski resorts too, they have alerts on their websites around the access for, um, for their resort because they're informing lots and lots of people. So I usually go to their website first to let, have them let me know what the access is for the roads. Awesome. And Diana, what about you? How do you decide on where it's safe to, to drive and tow with the airship? Well, I'm really listening to watching for the weather, right? Mm -hmm. So um, it happened many times that uh, I was going to get stuck in a, snow, a snowstorm, so I'm not taking any chances. I'm just going to go to a truck stop, stay overnight there, wait for this, the sky to clear up and get back on the road in the following day. So really, it's watching for the weather. Um, as Andrea said, if you're planning to go on a resort, you know, call them, ask them what's, uh, what's the weather like, what's the condition, the access, how's the road. I have a four by four and, uh, well, you know, I obviously use it a lot in the winter time. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and I want to just add something that uh, I didn't mention on this slide. Um, yes, as you're going to use a lot of propane, make sure to watch for your detector. So your healthy detector and your CO2 detector, usually um, it's recommended to replace your CO2 detector every 10 years and then your healthy detector every seven years. So as I said, like when you're full timing or even just um, you know camping for a while in uh, winter time and using a lot of propane, you need to check uh, safety first. Awesome, that's great. So uh, Diane, you've given us a, a little bit of background and, ex and your experience boondocking in the winter time. Andrea will kind of share a little bit of insight and advice from her experience uh, in her base camp, mostly being plugged in. Yeah, I've had both experiences, both plugged in and not plugged in. And um, it, for me, being plugged in is far preferable to being not plugged in. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, not all of the ski resorts have that. When you are plugged in, it's important to um, observe a couple of things. One is to make sure that there's snow isn't going to be falling off of trees and knocking your power, uh, your power off of your trailer or off of the connector. So keep an eye out uh, every day. I've also had a situation where, for fun, a bunch of teenagers went around and unplugged everybody. So I came back from skiing and my trailer was unplugged. So you really just got to keep an eye out on, on being plugged in. If um, if you're not plugged in. Um, you really, I am relying on my solar. Uh, so you really have to clear the snow off of the solar panels and make sure that you're parked somewhere in the parking lot where you're getting some snow. For me, I have lithium batteries in my base camp and in the summertime, I can go up, go for up to four weeks without plugging in. In the wintertime, it's completely different. It's just a couple of days that I could go without plug, being plugged in. And the tank heaters draw a huge amount of battery power. So um, you've got to be very conscious and watching your meters if you are boondocking in the base camp uh, and not plugged in in the winter. Good, good experience and good advice. Uh, Diane, tell us a little bit about the, you know, the, the glamorous side of Airstream that we all love to talk about is that, you know, kind of tank management. Uh, <laughs> what are some of the, the tips and advice that you'd use uh, when kind of managing this system when it's cold outside? Well, um, first in the winter time, I always travel with my fresh water tank full because it's gonna take a lot of uh, freezing temperature to freeze a full uh, tank of water. So always full and uh, same with the gray and black tank or combined if you have a Bambi um, or a Caravel, but you have, I really need to have all my, my full, both tanks full before emptying, it, right? So that's what I'm looking for when they're really full. So, you know, check your, your connection and, and, the, and whenever it's full, just empty it. I also had, I let this tab on hot water, you know, just to give it a good rinse after. And also you'll find sometimes the valve's pretty hard to open <laughs> when it's freezing. So I have a heat gun, 
you have to use it really wisely, not too close to the valve, but that's gonna really help to release the valve. There is other tips. If you don't have a heat gun, you can use a hair dryer. Uh, you can also use a bucket of warm water to release the valve, but really wait till your, your tanks are full to, um, to empty it. Another thing is for your hose, um, make sure there's nothing sitting in it. So just lift it up and give it a good rinse um, and uh, before, um, before you unhook or you get on back on the road. But yes, always fresh tank full and uh, waiting for my both tanks of gray and black to be full before emptying it. And, and let's walk through that a little bit. So the, the uh, thinking behind the fresh tank full especially when you know that you're going to be driving a few hours through cold temperatures to get to the place you're going to be camping. Um, harder to freeze a lot of water than a little yeah. water, right? Is that the thinking behind that? So if we uh, exactly. make the effort harder and, and decrease the likelihood of that, that freezing. Um, so that makes perfect sense. Tell me a little bit about the logic <clears throat> behind uh, waiting for your waste tanks to be full before you empty them. Is that, is anything kind of, related to winter camping there, or is that just the best practice that you consider? Well, I, I, I found that, you know, it takes, uh, it's way easier to flush your tank when it's full too, right? Okay. So you want yep. more liquid than solid, obviously, uh, to really, uh, to really um, um, flush it. So yeah, I'm, you know, I started to do that all year round, regardless. Um, I, in the summer, uh, before I leave, I, I put some buckets of uh, ice cubes in it to give it a good rinse and a good, you know, um, clean up uh, before I go. But yeah, obviously uh, really um, wait till it's full and it's gonna be way easier to empty it. Okay, um, great advice. Valve, you, know, you don't have to deal with opening the valve all the time if when it's frozen, that's another reason to. Good point, good point. Couple questions here around um, uh, Andrea and and Diane. When you're looking at your your battery meters <clears throat> and your boondocking, uh, and this is great because each of you has Andrea, you have lithium. Diane, you have uh, this this standard lead acid batteries. Andrea, how low do you get? Let your um, your batteries get in your trailer before you th you're thinking about you know either getting up and going or finding a place to plug in or recharging. Yeah, with the lithium batteries, um, it's different than in the other batteries. If I get below 40%, I'm a little bit worried because they drop rapidly after that point. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm trying to keep them above 40%. Um, and I, um, I have noticed, obviously, in the winter that they, they um, are dropping more quickly. And the solar doesn't charge them as quickly in the winter as it does in the summer. And I think an important piece there is um, a lot of the lithium battery systems uh, will actually have heating pads because they're not really good once you get them too cold um, at, at taking a charge, uh, particularly when it's when it's below freezing. Yeah. Diane, what about what about you? How what's the the voltage amount? Because you have the the standard display in yours where you know the sea level system where it gives you you know twelve point something. Um, what's your trigger to go start the generator? Uh, well. I found that depending on the temperature, like let's say if I'm on the road or I'm boondocking, um, I'm going to be in there like in the low fives. Uh, I found out that my furnace, because I'm, of course, this is the whole the whole point is to run the furnace winter time. Right. So um, I found out that I cannot really uh, go above six six between six and eight hours, right? Um, my batteries won't last more than that. So basically, you know, as soon as I'm, uh, I've been I've been on the road all day. I've been driving. I've been charging my batteries. I start for the, you know, I always start before dark, right? That's that's kind of a, a safety thing. Sometimes it doesn't happen, but you know, I always try to to park before dark, and then I know that you know, in low fives, yeah, six eight hours. So I know that after dinner time, uh, um, I might have to plug my generator, right? So basically, you have to assess depending on your your temperature, outside temperature, your own batteries, right? And um, yeah, but uh, yeah, the key is the generator for sure, for sure. And if you're right. boondocking, if you have shore power, it's great. You can connect everything on shore power, but uh, the generator is really helpful. 
And a handful of questions coming in. I can I can share you know, my my experience, Diane. This will be a follow up for you. So questions coming in about okay, do you do you run the furnace while you're driving? Right? Do you do this? So I know that from a, a regulatory standpoint, every state, at least in the U.S., uh, has its own guidance and and rules around this. Um, in places where I can, I will always opt to keep the furnace on low while I'm driving. Uh, it's also, you know, in my instance, powering my refrigerator. So you know, my guidance there would be check your check your local state. But you know, my experience has been that, you know, as an individual, I, I've, I've done that and had had good success. Same for you or what, what's your approach there with the furnace? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, as you said, depending on your state regulation or province regulation, uh, you know, just check that out first. But yeah, when I can, I run my furnace and I run my fridge, you know, I mean, when you're full time and you have that's it's it's your own it's your house right <laughs> so i run it and uh, and then that way you know i can stop usually i stop every hour anyway regardless to check everything so that everything is working good the infl my tires inflated um mm -hmm. my waste distribution heat everything so uh you know you stopped and you go inside your trailer it's all warm and cozy so it's it's really it's really nice but yeah check your regulations first and if you can that will really help also um you know the preventing from your pipes from freezing bursting or anything right and Chris, awesome so for me, yep, go ahead andrea I usually heat my trail up as much as I can before I, I take off for the ski hill. Um, and I don't run my furnace when I'm, when I'm traveling, but I'm not driving more than two or three hours. And then the minute I get to the parking lot, I right away turn the furnace on, plug in, get the tank heaters going. Just um, don't dilly dally and go, go get a beer at the bar. <laughs> right. deal, deal with the trailer first and then go. <laughs> So, okay. Yeah. All right. So the, the, the kind of the, the preheat approach. Yeah. Uh, before you go, that's that's smart. So we've talked a lot about you know battery consumption and energy usage. Uh, you know, just some best practices here. You know, things you should always do before you're going out on a trip is you know take a look at your batteries and your battery system. Make sure that everything's connected. There isn't any corrosion. If you have batteries that you know aren't sealed, uh, and make sure they're topped off with distilled water. Um, you know, along the way. Andrea, I know that yours are a little bit more difficult to get to just because of where the lithium batteries are in your base camp. So you're probably doing this, you know, about maybe once a year, but also you're keeping a, a, a close eye on the monitoring system that, that came with those batteries. Right, for sure. Yeah. What, there was one question here just in terms of the capacity. Do you know how big the, the, the batteries are in your base camp? Off the top of your head, putting you on the spot. No, I don't. I know that there's two. I put in two lithium batteries, um, but okay. I don't know what the capacity is. No. Okay. Sorry. All right. I should know, but I don't. It's okay. No problem. Yeah. No problem. So, you know, a big piece uh, of the winter air streaming experience is is the the getting there, uh, and then also backing into, uh, you know, your your camping spot or getting into your camping spot. So, Diane, what are some tidbits that you could share with us? Well, uh, first is go slow, go slow. So um, never, you know, of course, you're not going to use your cruise control when you're towing on the snow. Uh, you want to be alert. And um, yeah, and the s s go slow is really the key. It gives you uh, time to brake slowly. Um, if you're in this, if you're sliding, embrace the turn. Um, try look for black ice. Uh, I always say, you know, before towing in the snow, try to drive in the snow first, right? Coming from south of France, I mean, of course, I've been skiing in the Alps before moving to Canada, but. Wow, it was a big change when I arrived in Canada. I had to learn how to drive on the snow. So, you know, get familiar, right, with, this, with uh, driving on the snow. The thing is that, um, yeah, look for the weather, look for black eyes. If you don't, it, and uh, never be behind too, too close to the person in front of you. Um, the main thing is really to, um, to look for your really the maintenance of your vehicle, right? You need a reliable vehicle. So um, tires, uh, do the maintenance. Uh, I always pack uh, things, necessarily things like water and uh, we'll go th through that uh, later on. But um, yeah, so check your, check your vehicle and uh, check your setup, weight distribution each. I have a torque wrench. I'm always looking at uh, my tires, inflation, 
And uh, yeah, I mean, you know, if you don't feel comfortable at some point, just go on the side of the road, wait, and, uh, and you know, you'll uh, just reassess, right? I mean, look for your weather forecast. And uh, yeah, so there is a, something here on the side that is very important. Yeah, it's move as soon as you're, you start to, to park, move your trailer. And Andrea will confirm that with me. Uh, whether you're using those uh, Legos or two by four, I mean, I, I have, I, you, you know, all kinds of things that you to lever your trailer, right? So try to move your trailer so that it doesn't freeze to the ground, right? But uh, other than that, yeah, it's uh, just a question of practicing. Look for trees when you back up your trailer. Uh, practice, I always say practice on empty uh, school parking lot or empty churches uh, parking spot and practice your driving, practice your backing up. And uh, yeah, go slow. So slow will uh, will win the race for sure. Say when it comes to the base camp, uh, some people ask, do you need a brake controller or not with the base camp? And I would say if you're going to be doing winter driving with the base camp, absolutely, you really, really, really need the brake controller. Um, if you're going to be doing any kind of winter with the base camp, I think having the brake controller is necessary all seasons with the base camp. Uh, and then my experience with um, going into uh, parking lots of ski resorts is a couple of things. The weather, you know, if you're there for two or three days, the weather can change. I try to put my trailer on the Lego levelers, whether I need them or not. Um, I've had a couple of experiences where my tires have frozen into the parking lot uh, and I've had to um, pour hot water for an hour or so on my tires to release them from the ice. So get the, get the trailer up. Um, and allow um, yourself the ability with your car when you when you relocate your car to move your car every day because um, it too also it can freeze into the ice or it can get boxed in and also with these ski resorts the snow plows are super active at four o'clock in the morning five o'clock in the morning and they can push snow right in front of your trailer and right in front of your car so I always bring a shovel with me to um, shovel out the snowplow debris that's left in front of my trailer and my car in the ski resort parking lots. Good advice. I've also had uh, an experience just in terms of understanding how the tow vehicle and trailer behave differently when you're maneuvering. I found it, uh, I noticed a particular difference when you're trying to, to back into that spot. So in Andrea's use case, you're, you're backing into basically a parking spot at a ski resort on dry gravel, the ability to really do sharper turns with the trailer exists. In this environment, it's it's almost like driving on, on sand if anyone has ever camped at the beach before, um, where you have to take kind of shallower, more gradual turns to do that. Because if you try to push it too hard, it's just going to slide. It's not going to do the turn that you want. So um, just just building onto what you guys shared there. Um, a big piece of this though is, is tires, not just taking care of your tires once you go camping, but also having the right tools and traction when you're going. Diane, tell us a little bit about your approach to doing this. Yeah, so um, I always carry chains and uh, my I have a lot of uh, uh, supplies in my truck uh, just to be on the safe side. So I, I have uh, chains for the truck and for the, uh, the trailer as well. Uh, as you can see on the, on the picture here, I, I cover my tires. So I do that regardless, uh, summertime, wintertime, even if I just camp for a few days, um, just to protect your tires. Um, and yeah, and uh, you can see here on, the, on, on the, that picture, the generator as well. That's my, like, I, I really, you will need that regardless. But uh, yeah, so, you know, each, uh, each uh, trip, make sure um, to give a good rinse to your trailer too, you know, as soon as, uh, because of course, when you're gonna be on the road in the winter time, you're gonna have some salt. So same thing as if when you're parking your trailer on the beach, uh, once in a while, you need to give it a good rinse. So yeah, check your tires. That's really, really important. And, uh, and keep your chains with you in case you need it. Awesome, and just some questions here that are, have come in. Andre, when you uh, use your base camp to go skiing, are you, you're traveling with water and all that? Are you filling up at home before you go to the, the ski hill? Um, I've done both. I've done it where I've just brought uh, drinking water where I can make coffee with the drinking water um, and, and flush with it. And I've also filled my entire tank. If I know I'm going to be plugged in, I will fill my water tank. 
If mm -hmm. I am not plugged in and I'm using those tank heaters, I'm not going to fill my water tank um, because it's the tank heaters are just going to drag on those on the uh, battery. Okay, awesome. Another question here um, on kind of the minimum temperature that you should put your furnace at. So Diane, this is probably more for our world with having trailers with for forced air furnaces. Mine has been, you know, if I know that I'm going to do a couple of trips back to back, I'll leave it plugged in in between those trips and I'll just keep the furnace at 40, which is the lowest setting I can put it at, I think in my, in my trailer. And that has been enough to kind of keep everything from, from freezing if I'm not going to, to, to be there again. You know, that's in Seattle as well, where it doesn't get, you know, terribly below freezing often, but I've had good luck with 40. What's been your uh, kind of experience with the minimum that you could set it at? Well, um, I usually leave it at 60. Okay. Right. But um, just because also I have dogs, right? <laughs> so oh, <that's> right. <laughs> the dogs stay in the, if I'm out of the trailer, I, I want my dogs to be comfortable. So I leave the furnace at 60. But uh, yeah, I mean, the thing is that just uh, open your, um, open your closet, let the, the hair circulate, right? When usually when I'm out of the trailer, and that I leave it at 60, I close the fans just you know if it's only my dogs inside the trailer for a few hours they're not going to create as much as condensation as when we're all in it so so then the heat stays um and for safety purposes i don't leave uh, the space eater or infrared eater i turn it off so i just leave the furnace on when i'm away of the trailer right but okay. uh, another thing is that uh, you know you have you you, you can ask if you leave your trailer in a cold temperature and you're worried about freezing, uh, you know, just chat with people around you. They can always, if there is a power outage, um, plug your heated water hose and uh, plug it to your generator, uh, right? So there is a lot of a sense of camaraderie right? anyway when you're camping, especially winter time, right? We're dealing with challenging uh, <laughs> temperature here. So, so people are helpful. Great advice. And this, this next slide, I know that this is, you know, one brand, uh, and just a quick disclaimer here: we have you know, no no affiliate relationship with with uh, you know any of the the gear that we're about to mention uh, on the next slide. This is just you know pieces of of gear that you know, the group has discovered here to make this easier. A bunch of different ways to skirt the airstream, Diane. You find you found one that was actually kind of clever in terms of setup and storage. Yeah. So. What I usually I do, and I've done that for many years, is that I didn't want to buy the regular skirting with the, 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 the snaps, you know, that goes on the shell. So basically, I used uh, snow. <laughs> so I make sure that the snow doesn't accumulate on the roof, right? Because, of course, the extra weight is not good. So basically, I use the, the, the snow from the roof, and I insulate the bottom of my trailer. There is regular skirting, up, skirting options. Uh, people are also using, you know, billboards or um, or bubble wrap or other kind of things. I I don't recommend A because A is a fire hazard and it's gonna bring critters to your trailer. So basically, I only use snow and um, and this company, yeah, they came with inflatable uh, tubes that are basically uh, the, the biggest tube is on I believe 13 pounds. And uh, it's a full timer actually living in his airstream. We came up with that ID, and the whole package can fit easily in your truck or in your SUV. And it's uh, basically the size of um, the weight of an uh, inflatable kayak. So any woman can carry that around. So, yeah, so I'm looking forward to have it and try it on because uh, so far I only use uh, snow. Um, another thing with skirting is that. Uh, when it's very cold, you can add another space eater underneath the belly pan. So basically you will have warm inside the trailer and uh, eat um, underneath. So that will help too. But yeah, so I'm looking forward to that. I think it's a, a great concept. Awesome. And Andre, you take, it, take a slightly different approach to it. Yeah, I, I take a different approach to it. I use um, Reflectix, which is the bubble wrap. Um, and I bought, um, I think it's in a picture of it is in one of the slides coming up. Yep. Um, but yep. I, I use the existing snow that's around the trailer, pulling snow off the roof and letting it drop to the side of the trailer. And then I use the bubble wrap to create a skirt around the base camp. 
and use the snow to kind of push up against it and seal it up against um, the, the trailer. It's, it's been fine because I'm only there for like one or two nights. I feel like that's good enough. If I were doing what Diane does where I'm going on much longer trips, I would definitely do this. Um, it looks like a flotation device where you could take your Airstream down the Grand Canyon. <laughs> that looks pretty cool. <laughs> but um, I, I'm okay with the bubble wrap. Okay. Awesome. And then here's just, a, you know, just general items to have with you. I think this would apply, um, you know, if you're driving through, you know, just in your passenger car, stuff to have with you or to, to consider to have with you, um, you know, windshield, wipe, windshield wiper fluid or washer fluid, right? Always having to kind of clean the windshields, towels, everything from blankets to uh, drying everything that gets wet when it is snowing outside, an ax to maybe clear something uh, some debris out of the out of your route of travel. Um, a great collapsible uh, avalanche shovel to be able to kind of dig yourself out if you need. Flashlight is always great to have. And then everything on the right here is just anticipating, hey, I might need to spend some time out of my vehicle, changing a tire, uh, you know, checking, uh, doing the walk around and checking the, 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 the tires and, uh, and things like that. So these are all just kind of hey, we might be exposed to cold temperatures for a while. Let's be comfortable while we're out there. But Andrea, let's get a little bit more specific with some of the gear that you really like to use to make air streaming easier in the winter. Yeah, I'm pretty simple in this. Uh, for me, when I bring my ski gear in, it's wet, it's drippy. Um, so I like to have a bunch of old towels that I can dry my gear off with. Um, and I use the Reflectix, as I said previously, as the outside skirting. Um, and I use an additional shoe tray. The shoe tray that's in the base camp is awesome for, you know, smaller shoes, but for my ski boots and snow boots, I use an additional shoe tray to keep the floor dry. Um, also the floor in the base camp just always, is always getting wet in the winter. So I, I use additional towel, towels to clean. And then I have a blow dryer to heat up my ski boots in the morning before I put them on and heat my uh, snow boots up before I put them on just uh, because they're, uh, easier to go out the door once I am about to go skiing. It's uh, truly all the comforts of home. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then here's here's just some slides that we pulled together. Maybe just kind of walk us walk us through your, your your setup here. We have one more slide too after this, Andrea, that kind of shows where you store the gear when yeah. it's not being used. So um, usually the base camp, you are the smallest trailer in the parking lot, um, and uh, you do have to store your gear in your trailer. If you are putting it in your car, you know, then the next morning you need to bring it into your trailer to warm it up. Um, and I do, if you go to the next slide, Chris, I do use my wet bath to dry my gear. The, the skis, the goggles, the wet, and the hair dryer is really, really helpful to, you know, dry the goggles or whatever I need. But I'm pretty simplistic in my approach. And generally when I go camping at a ski resort, it's just me in the trailer. So it's me and my gear. Quick uh, rapid question for each of you. Coldest temperature you've camped in. And Diane, if you could uh, remember the Fahrenheit variation of it, that would save us the equation. But I, we'll, take, we'll take either way, Celsius or Fahrenheit. Minus 20 Celsius, that would be a little less than zero Fahrenheit. OK. Yeah. Andre? Yeah, I think the, um, the coldest I've been in was around 15 or 12, but the biggest issue in, when it comes to temperature is the swings where it's 35 and raining in the afternoon. And then at night it drops down to 15 and you are mm. rock solid frozen in the parking yes. lot. So that's the biggest issue with temperature. Yeah. I want to perfect thing about the, that temperature. Um, I wouldn't recommend to open your awning at this temperature, right? So because it's going to be hard to close it. So just keep it closed, right? Yeah. And you good, don't want good, to accumulate of snow on the awning either, right? So I'll just keep it closed. Good advice. And Diane, walk us through some of uh, your gear that makes air streaming easier in the winter. Yeah. So as Andrea said, Reflectix is one of our best friends. So basically, if you can tuck it in anywhere in the closet, I'm, I stapled Reflectix in my outdoor compartments. Um, and here, as you can see, I put it on the, I apply it on the floor too, to add extra uh, warmth. On the top, I have rice, so it doesn't look like that. It looks a little bit better when I have my <laughs> on the I just wanted to show that. So yeah, and also I, um, I cut reflectors to the size of the windows. I need light. 
So I never cover all my windows. I only cover my windows inside uh, at night in my bedroom. That's pretty much it. Never cover your windows outside. Don't tape anything, uh, any vinyl or anything. Your clear, clear coat won't like that. There's gonna be a tape residue. So um, I, I highly recommend if you wanna use Reflectix inside, just use it inside, not, not a, no, nowhere else. So yeah, here you see the generator again, a, a very good friend. I mean, solar panels, winter time, they won't be really useful, uh, especially here, West Coast. It's always a little bit cloudy. So. Yeah, generator is really uh, is really good. I mean, I can run my space heater, my infrared heater, uh, uh, coffee, have a warm coffee. Uh, uh, I like espresso, so I have my coffee. I'm all good. So yeah, it, um, the generator is really useful. Heat gun again. Um, use it wisely, especially on plastic valves. But uh, it's really a good a good friend too. And a, a build on the heat gun and and what Andrea mentioned earlier with the temperature swings. I had once the, the craziest piece of ice form on my stairs. As I was getting ready to leave, of course, I realized there was this chunk of ice that was frozen and I couldn't put the stairs in, so I couldn't drive away. So the heat gun, I didn't have one. I wish I would have, because it would have made that chore a bit easier. Um, so the heat gun, lots of uses there. Diane, I just wanted to build on the on the generator. So you're, you're mostly plugged in, but you brought up a great point. It's the winter time. There are often winter storms and there are often power outages. So when you're looking at the risk of if I lose power and stuff is going to freeze, it's just great to have the, the peace of mind there with that generator. Exactly. And uh, this is lightweight. So, you know, it's it's really easy to put it in the truck, get it out. Um, but the thing is that, yeah, usually uh, um, I have around between five and ten power outage in the wintertime. It's always wow. at the worst. Right. So it's in the middle of the night. So it's like, okay. <laughs> so, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, when you have the generator, how many times uh, I was in a campground and I was the only one with, uh, um, with water running, no frozen pipes, warm and cozy mm -hmm. inside. So, right. so yeah, that works. That works. Just a bit of organization. Walk us through uh, the, the second slide here on your, uh, your gear, gear selection. Yeah, so here, so again, uh, really the basic uh, heated water hose, um, heat tape also works great. Um, I like when it's warm, obviously, so um, I have a heated mattress pad and I have a heated blanket, so I turn that on and it's all toasted before I go to bed. Another thing too is that because you're going to live in your trailer, you're going to be or camp, either way, but you're gonna build condensation, cooking, showering, breathing. Um, you need to find a ventilation pad that you're gonna put between your mattress and your um, your the plywood, right? Because between the body heat meeting with the outdoor outside uh, cold, it's gonna create a lot of condensation and you wanna be away from, sorry about that. You wanna be away from the, the mold, right? So, sorry. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so that's something that I use and uh, you can find it uh, online. It's just a pad. There is all kind of DIY options as well. Sorry. <laughs> Another thing here that I have is propane. So what happened is that depending on your trailer, you might have between 40 to 60 pounds of propane, but uh, sorry, I'm taking my little one. But uh, I, um, I always found that actually um, you're gonna use a lot of propane and you don't wanna run out of propane in the middle of the night. And believe me, it happened to me plenty of times. So I always carry uh, extra bottle of propane in the truck. Right, I always have one regardless for my fire, uh, fire, propane fire pit and for my um, barbecue, but I always ha have an additional one because I don't want to run out of propane. Depending on where you are and if you're staying, let's say for a month or two in a spot, um, you might find you might have uh, find you know those big propane bottle that you can uh, rent for a little while, so you don't have to carry extra bottle. But that that being said, it's when you're stationary for a little while. So uh, if you're on the road, just carry extra bottles. Moisture grabber, you can see that on the picture. Again, you don't want to create mold in your trailer, so I always have extra. Uh, moisture grabbers that I that I put, you know, in the closet, underneath the sink, uh, in the pantry, uh, because again, you want you don't want to have 
uh, build up uh, mold in your trailer. So yeah, that's that's pretty much um, my my little basics for uh, comfortable uh, winter living, winter camping, winter streaming. Chris, I will add something about gear and the base camp. Is that the yeah. uh, the air that comes out in the base camp from the from the heater is on the bottom of the the uh, lazarettes, the benches, mm -hmm. as yep. well as an opening on the side. And it's really easy to block those vents in the base camp with mm. your gear. Um, and because you're yep. always putting gear on the floor or like, oh, I'll just put my, my briefcase here, my purse here. And um, you know, before you know it, your, your bag is super hot and your base camp <laughs> is cold. So you really got to, especially with the base camp, and I think it's really just true of the base camp, you really got to be careful as to what you put on the ground and if you're blocking the furnace. And it's also true when you put the bed down at night, um, there's less circulation for that heat at night in the base camp. So I try to leave a little bit of an opening at the, at the foot of the beds because that is one of the main openings for the furnace um, in the base camp. So just don't stuff, your, don't stuff gear against the walls, try to keep it up high hanging so that you're not blocking your heat. Yeah, that's a, and that's a great piece of advice, I think, uh, across a lot of the, the product line, because the forced air furnace vents are usually hot air rises, so let's put them on the bottom, so right, uh, the, the hot air goes up. So that, I think that's good advice, uh, not just for base camp owners, but across the travel trailer line. A couple questions here are coming in. Diane, when you put chains on the trailer tires, did you do both, because you have a double axle, double axle trailer, did you put chains on both, so four sets of chains, or four chains? Yes, did. You did. Okay. All the way around. Uh, Andrea, you mentioned clearing off the solar panels in the, in the snow. Mm -hmm. What are you using? Just a, a broom or how do you, how, or just, I, I guess if they're I, on the roof, how do you get up there? Yeah. Um, well, I hate to tell you what I've done. I parked my car close <laughs> to my base camp and crawled on top of the car and, you, and swiped it away. Or I use like my ski pole and pull down the snow. I don't have a great system, but I keep an eye out on it. Awesome. Um, let's go. Uh, P Patricia shared one piece of advice. We we're talking about kind of gear to keep in the car. She says, hey, I keep inside my vehicle all the time, a hairdryer, a big lighter, an extension cord, and WD-40 to melt the, the ice on the door and in the keyhole, which is, I think, a great one, too. Really it's, good point. Uh, yeah. yeah. Get, getting locked out because you can't get the key in is, is no good. Right. Um, what's one piece of advice you'd share? So, you know, a lot of people here are here to learn about how to do this. Um, and, and hopefully we'll kind of embark on this journey here in the coming months. Uh, Andrea, what's one piece of advice that you'd share based on your experience so far? Well, for me, it's keep it simple. Don't overpack, don't overdo, uh, don't over uh, extend yourself. Go for a couple days at first, but just keep it simple. It's not worth uh, having too much stuff and having too much food or being there too long, one extra night. Just keep it simple. Awesome. Uh, Diane, how about, how about you? Well, um, yeah, I agree with Andrea. Um, and um, well, my piece of advice is, you know, get your basics, right? Uh, as I said, like heated water hose, that's part of it, some reflectix, uh, a generator if you can. Uh, and uh, yeah, just, uh, just dive in, just do it and you will enjoy it. Start slow, go toe slow on the road, uh, try to avoid traffic uh, if you're starting to, to, to tow and if you're new at it and uh, you will just love it. It's, uh, it's really fun. I mean, uh, uh, I really encourage everyone to uh, winter camp because uh, I hate seeing people storing their stream and saying, oh, we can't camp anymore because uh, you can really camp all, we all year round. So, it, and it's pretty fun. Awesome, that's a uh, good, good advice. A couple, so lots of, lots of questions coming in here. We're gonna do our best to answer as many as we can. Uh, Amar asks, any recommendations on places to winter camp in the Northeast in the U.S.? And I know that, you know, a lot of people, you know, Andrea and, and Diane, both of you are based on the West Coast. But Carly, if you could pop in a couple of the links that we've done on best winter camping, I think we've done a couple of them and they're, they're broken out by areas of the country. So there should be a couple of Northeast options in there. Um, another question, Diane, for you. Where did you buy the heating tape and hoses? Was that an Amazon find or did you get it yeah, somewhere else? Yeah, it on Amazon. Uh, any kind of uh, RV dealership will sell that to you. As I said, like it comes in different lengths. 
and uh, it's really the best investment. I had, I only had a heated tape before and I was wrapping it up around my hose. <laughs> and uh, it makes a real big difference when you just buy the heated water hose, you just plug it, it's easy. Make sure though, when you cover it with styrofoam, make sure that you don't cover the thermostat uh, so you can start to warm it up your hose um, as soon as it starts to freeze. Awesome. Um, Rainier has a question here around the outdoor shower as a potential weak point in terms of freezing pipes. So what has been, Andrea, I know that on your base camp, your, your shower actually passes through from the wet, from the, from the inside. So you don't have a separate shower there. So probably less of a risk for you. Diane, what about you and the kind of the outdoor shower? Never touch it, never needed to. I don't even okay. know in the, the, the compartment. I am, yeah. It's a, you don't need to, to do anything to that. Some people will have to re, will remove the head of the shower and things like that. But uh, for me, I mean, I never had to touch it. So it's, uh, it's okay. Yeah. Um, any issues when either of you have been traveling where you've actually, your, your trip has been interrupted because you've had to wait for weather to pass. So Scott specifically asked, have you had any issues crossing steep mountain passes like the Rockies or the Sierras? after a storm passes through? Well, uh, I would say you really gotta be follow for the plowing. Just keep, yeah. keep an eye out for the plowing and make sure that you're, you're going at least an hour or so after the plows have hit. Okay, so one of the benefits of traveling with the comforts of home is if the weather isn't, isn't great or it's not gonna support it, you can always, you know, Diane, we talked previously about you kind of paying out in a truck stop. Um, or you know, at a truck rest area, just waiting for weather to pass. Yeah. Um, to I do that, so that's great. I did a lot of that. Um, it's quite comfortable. You put the furnace on; it's warm inside. You have your food. You just relax and you just uh, wait uh, till the trucks are getting back on the road, and you follow the track. <laughs> there you go, Andre. <laughs> I'm going to put you on the on the spot just for a second. Maybe give you some time. Do you have a picture of your the skirting that you created with the Reflectix? Oh, that would be an embarrassing picture. <laughs> okay, all right. Um, <laughs> no, I don't have a picture of that. Um, okay. And you know, what's funny is that you can kind of barely see that the Reflectix is there because I'm piling the snow up along the sides of it. You know, I'm a great snow cave builder, um, but uh, you don't really see the Reflectix. You'd see a bunch of snow pushed up against the trailer. Okay, um, so to so the, you know, the person who asked that question, to just Google, Reflectix airstream skirt, and you'll get some you know, some oh, visual uh, yeah, inspiration. Yes, hopefully inspiration some there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Adam wants to know: uh, Will using a space heater with the cabinet doors open be sufficient to keep the tanks and pipes from freezing, as opposed to using the furnace? And so my answer, and keep me honest here, would be: You actually need to use both because the furnace is what's what's routing the air underneath to where the tanks are. If you have a forced air furnace would be probably a little bit slightly different if you didn't have a forced air furnace and you had electric heat pads, then you could explore, I think, not using, well, you wouldn't have a furnace to use in that situation. Um, the key to the furnace though, if you have one, is it uh, is uniquely suited to keep the tanks from freezing because of way that, the way that the ducting is routed underneath the floor. And in the base camp, it's, you have to have those tank heaters on. Really That's right. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. Um, let's see here. Some questions around um, around power. So when you guys are thinking about, you know, Diane, for you, enough power, you have standard lead acid batteries. You can go about a day running the furnace, uh, doing everything you need to do to stay comfortable and keep everything from freezing. Um, but you get about a day before you need to run the generator if you're in a boondocking spot. Yeah, yeah each right? time I cross Canada winter time, uh, basically, and I was boondocking. So basically, uh, you know, I'm in the morning. I was. I knew that I was. Uh, I, I was going back on the road around six, seven in the morning, and I knew I had to put the generator on uh, around one a.m. <laughs> so right. So <laughs> basically, first six, seven, eight hours uh, without the generator, and then back back at it. Right. So yeah, but it's totally doable. It's easy. Awesome. And one final question here, Diane. I'll, I'll toss this one your way. When you think about <clears throat> um, how long you're comfortable driving in really cold temperatures before you need to either stop and turn the furnace on for a bit, what's, what's your kind of stretch of time? How many hours are you looking at driving before you say, you know what, 
I, I'm good. I don't need to, to stop in midway and, and check on things. Um, well, usually three, four hours, right? And uh, uh, that's what usually I do. But I mean, I've told up to eight, nine, 10 hours, right? So uh, I don't recommend that to anybody starting, especially towing on the snow, on the ice. So yeah, three, four hours is, a, is probably a good time, right? And then before being tired and because you're gonna be more, you're gonna have to be more um, aware of your surroundings of the road when it's uh, winter conditions, especially if you're towing in the Rockies. Uh, so yeah, you don't wanna do, overdo it, right? It's, uh, it's always about fun and pleasure first. I would add, if you're going to a ski resort, really think about, am I going to be heading up when everybody else is heading down? And, you know, am I creating a problem for myself uh, in terms of access to that parking lot when everybody's trying to get out of it? I try to think about my arrival time to these parking lots too. Smart. Lots of unanswered questions in the chat here. Uh, for the folks who we didn't get to answering your question, please send it over to hello at airstream.com. That's H-E-L-L-O at airstream.com. Andrea, Diane, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your knowledge and expertise about getting out in the wintertime. Really appreciate it. And if everyone would take a moment to fill out the two question survey on the next screen. Have a great weekend. Thank you.